Hello everybody and welcome to our second part of our series at Looking at the Puritans. Now this lesson is on this book by John Flavo, a Puritan, and it's based on meditating upon this passage in Proverbs 4.23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So this lesson we will learn from him. Now how do we keep our heart? And how it is important to keep the heart because the heart is the source of the activities in life as per this verse. Let us think about what is keeping the heart. We will refer to using the holy means of grace to preserve our soul from sin and to maintain that sweet communion with God. And this is an active duty. Okay, This duty is ours, but knowing that the power to do so is God's. Christ said, without me, you can do nothing. And as per our passage, we do it with diligence. So that tells us that we are to be focused and this is not something easy to do. So we are to keep the heart for the heart is the fountain of all our actions. And the heart is where is the origin of both good and evil actions. So we are, of course, to ensure that the heart is focused on good actions for God. So the doctrinal summary of this book is that the keeping and right managing of the heart in every condition in life is the great business of a Christian's life. So we are to ensure our hearts are stable and focused towards God. So a quote by John Flavel here. It is not the cleansing of the hand that makes the Christian. For many a hypocrite can show as fair a hand as he, but it is a purifying, watching, and right ordering of the heart. So Flavor focuses here on what is internal, of course, what is in the heart. He knows the danger of how we can be hypocrites by just um, having Christian actions, right? Christian outward actions without having a Christian heart. Okay, so this book about keeping the heart is not about what you are to do to show to other people, but it's what you are to do in your private lives to keep your heart. Okay, so just a brief summary of the doctrine of the regenerated heart. Okay, we know that unbelievers cannot regenerate their own hearts. And believers are those whom God has regenerated their hearts. Their hearts are made alive for Him. And for us believers who are regenerated with a regenerated heart, our duty is that we put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. This is our duty as regenerated men to live like regenerated men. Okay, so keeping the heart means the diligence to persevere as this renewed man living according to God's word. Okay, briefly, just six main principles in this duty of keeping the heart. First is, we observe our hearts often. Psalm 77 verse 6, I commune with my own heart. Right? Knowing your heart well. Second is, you know, as we study our hearts, we are to be humble and grieve when we discover evils in our hearts. Just like Hezekiah in this passage. As we discover the evils in our hearts, we are to pray to God instantly. It's not just praying for forgiveness of sins, but to pray to God that we have a heart to love Him more, that we have a heart to hate sin more, have a heart to walk more with God. And also a duty is to engage ourselves to walk more with God and to avoid tempting situations. Okay, this is what we resolve to do as we discover the evils in our hearts. How do we avoid sin? And we are to be jealous when our heart wanders away from us. You know, when, we re- when we resolve to do this and that and our heart is wandering away, we do what we can to bring our hearts back into control. Right? We know that our hearts can wander away from God and so we are jealous. We want our hearts to be faithful to to God. And per Psalm 16, we set the Lord always before you. 
He's our focus. We have the knowledge that He, he is always there. He's looking over our lives. And so we live our lives with this knowledge that He is watching every part of our lives. And so again, we're not concerned about our actions, just our mere, mere outward actions, but knowing that God knows everything, that God is always before us, would cause us to keep our hearts, what is inside of us, pure. Okay, here we acknowledge the difficulty of keeping our hearts. Flavo says this, heart work is hard work. And he says that doing external duties, you know, in church and all that is easy compared to searching our hearts for sin and seeking God for this. Okay, he's saying that public duties is not as hard as this private duty before God. And this keeping the heart needs to be constant all the way in life, of course. So the example he gives, this illustration is, you know, Exodus 17. You know, Israel was fighting the war and when Moses' hands grow heavy and sink down, then Amalek, uh, the enemy, prevailed, right? So we are to be constant. Proverbs 2, 23, 26 says, My son, give me thine heart. You know, God owns our heart, but he calls us to give it. We are to give it you know, voluntarily. There's no use in doing other duties if we do not give God our heart. So again, it's better not to do duties if our heart is not given to God in it. Okay, and general motivations to keep the heart. First, heart evils provoke God. You know, Genesis 6.5 the flood came in Noah's time because man's heart was evil. The way the passage was, is saying is that it's not about murders or other evils that people were doing. That's why God caused the flood. But the reason we are given why the flood came was because man's heart was evil. Every man's heart was evil. Okay, second, we keep the heart because it shows the sincerity of our profession. Okay. The sincerity of our profession depends not on the, the external, okay, but it depends on the internal, again, what we said before. So an example is Jehu in 2 Kings 10. He obeyed God in what he did you know, to slay the evil people. But it says here, But Jehu took no heed to walk in the ways of the Lord God of Israel with his heart. So Jehu obeyed uh, instructions. Right, instructions to, to do this and do that. But it says here, he obeyed all his instructions, but he did not walk uh, in the ways of the Lord with his heart. So that's a reminder to us. We can do this and do that, but we can walk uh, we can walk in a way that our heart is not with God. Okay, and living rightly as the light of the world, as a testimony of the gospel to the world starts from the heart. And number four, assurance, you know, assurance of salvation comes through studying the heart. How can someone have assurance without studying his heart? It's through studying our hearts that we witness the Spirit's work in us. That's where we come uh, with assurance, right? And last, stability in temptations depends on the state of our hearts. A stable heart stops the first stages of temptation. So can unstable hearts hope to fight against the fierce temptations that face us? Okay, so these are general motivations for us to keep the heart. So we come to the main part of the book where we look at seasons in life, different seasons in life that can threaten our keeping of the heart. So this is the main part of the lesson. This is the main part of the book. We are looking at seasons in life, situations in life that can come to all of us or can come to some of us. The first is prosperity. Well, life is good. So how can we keep the heart in this season of prosperity? There is a danger. The danger is pride. The danger is having our trust be in our possessions. And the great danger is that we may forget God in our prosperity. So the passage in Deuteronomy reminds us of this. Moses speaking to Israel before they entered the land. 
And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, and give you houses full of good things which thou feelst not, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord. So we are to be focused on God in times of prosperity. We know that these things, prosperity can hold us down in our journey to heaven if we get distracted by them. These things may take away our time, take away our attention. And we're also, we also to consider that we are a steward of all that God gives to us. We are a steward of all that God gives to us and that should humble us and set us to think. And we are to think about if we are reacting rightly to prosperity. Are we reacting rightly to what God has given us? Just like Jacob, where he says, no, I am not worthy of the least of all thy mercies and all of the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. Okay? Jacob showed a humility at, the, at his possessions. And this is a right reaction that we should follow. And of course, we should see if we rejoice in the gifts or are we rejoicing in the giver. It's good to, it's okay, it's fine to rejoice in the gifts. But let it not be the only rejoicing we have. We are to rejoice chiefly in the giver. So let us consider if seasons of prosperity, is it making us closer to God? Or is it bringing us further away from God? Okay, some helps. We are to know the danger. Throughout the Bible, we know that riches are a temptation. All right? We also to remember how riches have ruined believers. For example, Israel, they struggled with riches. They struggled with prosperity. We are to know that God does not value you based on the value of your things. What is meant here is that we should ensure we spend time seeking what God values. Seek what God values in us rather than spending time seeking what we value. And John Flavor uh, reminds us that many rich men, believer or unbeliever, have regretted living their life, lives uh, seeking prosperity. Because whether you are an unbeliever or a believer, you know that you cannot bring your riches into the afterlife, correct? Okay, so these are the things that John Flavor calls us to consider in seasons of prosperity. Okay, so we come to the end of the first example, you know, Seasons of Prosperity. So from this first example, we can see how flavor causes us to think about the current season of life that we are in. Okay, here we see how he relates the season of prosperity to our heart okay, to ensure that we are living rightly before God in this season of prosperity. Okay, so from this first example, we will go on to further examples, further seasons in life. Okay, the next season of life is afflictions. How can we keep the heart in trials, afflictions, where our outward comforts are stripped? The danger is that we are discontented against God. And of course, in this situation, it's hard to keep the heart. So what is needed is an understanding of afflictions. We ought to know that afflictions can come from God's will. Right, but afflictions do not take away his love for us, and afflict and if afflictions come because of chastisement, right? For example, this uh, ex this passage here. Okay, if he commit iniquity, I will chasten him, right? But my mercy shall not depart from him. So. If God chastises you with affliction, that does not mean that His mercy has departed. In fact, His chastisements can be for good. Right? Chastisements are for our good. So Flavo says that instead of quarreling with God about this chastisement, you should instead admire that God can use chastisements, afflictions to refine you. And all these things are good for your soul. Okay, If all these things are done with love from God, just like a father to his son, why are you angry at this? Okay. Are you angry because you don't understand God's good purpose in this? 
And he says that we have two types of goods, the perishables of this life and the internal, eternal inheritance in Christ. Okay? If we lose the former, right, in afflictions when we lose the perishable things in life, and we know that we do not lose the latter, which is the in eternal inheritance in Christ, should we be cast down as much as we are right now? Is there no hope for a joy? Are we totally to be uh, despondent in our situation when we know that even though I've lost things in life, there is still this eternal inheritance in Christ that I will never lose? Should we be dead cast down when we know this? Moving on. Know that everything in your affliction, God allows, right? As a believer, he loves you and we should not suspect this while we are in affliction. Okay, God's view of you does not change with your trials. Often in trials, we sus suspect God, right? We suspect if whether he loves us still or not. Flavo says this, As God did not at first choose you because you were high, of a high position, so he will not forsake you because you are low. Okay? Even though, you know, when we are in afflictions, we have a very low view of our condition. We think that nobody cares for us and all that. Well, we cannot attribute that to God. Okay? God does not, God's care for us does not depend on our trials or our condition. Okay? Adversity does not buy you access from God. Just like how if a relative in a poor condition, he came to you, you help the person, right? He's your relative. He's precious to you. So likewise, why do we suspect God in our trials? We are to go to God. And again, God may have a design in whatever we lose. He has his purpose in whatever we lose. So we are to uh, be grateful. To be grateful to God that he has a purpose in my suffering, my afflictions. This is not a meaningless suffering. There is something good in it that I may not know that God has purpose for this affliction. So we are to be grateful. We are to be contented. Adversity may be how God answered your prayer. Now, what does he, what does John Flavel mean by this? What he means is that, you know, perhaps we have prayed for things like godliness and humility, you know, pray to be less worldly. And thus, the answer to all these prayers, God uses adversity. He uses afflictions to st stir up humility, st stir up godliness in us. Okay, so afflictions can be how God answers all these prayers for, you know, to be more godly, to be more humble. Right? God can use afflictions for uh, to answer all these prayers. And if we could see God's exact design and aim for our trials, we would rejoice. But most of the time, we do not know exactly why God sends us this or that trial. But if we could see God's good purposes in all this, I believe we would rejoice at His wisdom and His love towards us to send us all these trials. And we are to know that the discontentment from trials it's more dangerous than trials itself. If trials is just trials that affect our physical condition, okay, that is hard, that is hard, but we endure it. But if we allow all these physical afflictions to cause us spiritual afflictions, such as discontentment, then that is dangerous, right? So we cannot allow physical afflictions to be transformed into spiritual afflictions such as discontentment, okay? We are to endure the physical afflictions without letting it become spiritual afflictions. And that, is, that often happens when we, when we are in trials. We allow all these thoughts, all this discontentment to come into our hearts. Okay, next is the afflictions of the church. When the church suffers, we are also suffering. 
So how can we keep the heart when we see the church in trouble? The danger is that we are in utter despair and we complain against God for allowing all these problems to affect the church. So some helps. Remember, the church has treasures that the world can never take. Our covenant with God. So this is in a situation where there is no real dangers to the church. Okay, real dangers to the church. We know that there are treasures that the world can never take away from the church. And of course, it's useful to think of church history, how God has always preserved the church. You know, the Reformation, or even the book of Esther. Okay, and if we are worried about the church, right? We are worried about the church. How much more so Christ cares for the church? Right? So even if so when we as sinners have a concern about the church, the church, how much more so Christ cares for the church, his bride. So we are to rest in this fact that Christ cares for the church more than us. And we rest in that wonderful fact. Further helps. In Bible history, God has allowed Zion, the church, to be persecuted. Who are we to contest with God? So the concern here is that we get angry at God because he allows the church to be persecuted. Remember, God allowed, for example, the exile of Israel, right, for his purposes. So our job is not to be angry with God, to question God, but to remain obedient and faithful towards God. So an example here in this verse. Okay. Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem. So this whole work refers to the persecution that uh, they, the the Israelites are going to experience with Assyria. Okay, Assyria is going to harm uh, Israel, right? I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. Okay, so the whole of this passage, what uh, God is saying here is that God has a work in allowing persecution to Zion, to Jerusalem. God has his purpose. And our comfort is that this thing is tem- temporary. After that, God punishes, God will punish Assyria. And that is what we see. You know, Jerusalem uh, was brought back after the exile and Assyria was punished. The persecutors of the church were punished. So we can take comfort in these two facts again. God allows persecution to the church to happen, right? We can take comfort in that, that, it, that God is the one that allows it. The second thing is, God will punish the persecutors. Assyria, Babylon, God will punish. And that's another thing that we can take comfort in. Okay, church afflictions do not contradict that God is in the midst of her. Just because if the church suffers does not mean that God has left the church, right? And God can use trials to purify the church from worldliness. That is what we see in Israel. Flavo says here, it, is, it was not persecutions and prisons, but worldliness that was the poison of the church. So Flavo says that the danger to the church is not persecutions, but it is worldliness, the things that are inside. So a verse in Zephaniah 3.12, we are left a poor and afflicted people. Okay, we are afflicted, then we learn to trust in the name of the Lord. So God has his purposes in refining the church through trials. Okay, John Flavel has this part on public dangers. So this is not talking about COVID, but it's more talking about generally things that happen in the world, right? Global events that are happening in the world that can affect Christians. How can we keep the heart when we see troubles in our environment? The danger is distractions, distractions and fear in us. The verse to remind us, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of a sound mind. 
And Flavor's aim here is not to call us to be numb to dangers, to ignore everything dangerous outside in the world. It's always good to be cautious, right? But his fear is that we let fear be a tyrant in our hearts that weaken us and make us unfit for Christian duties. So we can relate that to our present situ- situation with COVID, right? We are to be cautious, it's good. But there is a fear that we allow you no know, COVID fear to be a tyrant in our hearts that weakens us so much that makes us unfit for Christian duties. So it gives us some reminders here that God is the one that sends disasters, sends wars to judge the world. He says here, a lion with freedom is terrible to meet. So the lion here symbolizes the dangers in the world, right? If the dangers in the world had freedom, it is terrible. But who is afraid of the lion in the keeper's hand? Okay, so what he's saying here is that we as Christians know that the dangers of the world, the lion, is in the hand of the keeper, is in the hand of the God. So that causes us, that gives us courage to not be afraid, right? Because we know that all things are in God's hands. However, dangers, all these dangers in the world can be spiritual dangers in Satan's hands because Satan can use all this to cause a great fear in our hearts to cause us to sin. And we are reminded that our fears can enlarge dangers more than it is. So we can see a danger and because we are so fearful, we enlarge the danger more than it actually is. And all this can make us distrust God. So in times like this, we hold on to general promises like Romans 8.28. Psalm 112 verse 7, He shall not be afraid of evil tidings, evil news. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. And flavor reminds us to be a good testimony to the world in the face of this kind of global dangers. And we are to ensure our fear of God is higher than your fear of anything else. Okay, this reverential fear of God is to be higher than the fear of whatever is out there. We cannot let the fear of anything be higher than our fear of God. Okay, next is the season of anger. So actually, this is something that we are facing every day, correct? So how can we keep the heart when anger you know, shakes us. The danger is our anger becomes sinful. It becomes excessive. This verse in Ephesians 4.26, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So there are things that can rightfully cause us to be angry. But whatever anger it is, whether it is wrong anger or right anger, there is a danger in excessiveness in our anger so we need to control our anger we all know that so some questions for ourselves first pride is linked to anger a a proud man easily gets angry because he easily thinks he is unworthily treated okay so before studying your anger you study pride first because pride is often the cause of our anger. Next, we are reminded that a man who communes with God often has the peace of God, and thus he is not so easily angered by others. Okay, This godly man who has the peace of God, he does not th- think it is worthy to leave the peace, of, peace with God to be root by anger. Okay, Because he's so settled with uh, the peace of God, with communing with God, he is not easily distracted to, to be angry with people because he knows the preciousness of having the peace of God in our hearts. The effects of anger, it gives place to the devil. Okay? The devil thrives in tempting us when we are angry. He, he fills our hearts with revengeful thoughts he fills our lips also, right? Sometimes we speak out against people because of uh, our anger. And we're also reminded that even Moses, 
who was a meek person. Even Moses was angry at times. So anger is a great danger. And Flavor reminds us that you know, even pagans, unbelievers, are more calm than Christians sometimes. We know that you know, other religions also call their, the people of their religions to keep calm, to not be angry. So when we see this, we are also humbled by ourselves. You know, just because just because we're Christians does not mean that we automatically automatically are peaceful people. No, we as Christians we have an anger issue to deal with ourselves. So we are to be humble. And it's a wonderful work of grace in you to conquer anger. Okay? So when we come to we are, when we are tempted to be angry, it is a test, a test for us. And if we do conquer our anger, that is a wonderful work that God has done in our hearts to conquer anger. So conquering ang- anger is something that is wonderful that we should pursue. And his practical tip, tip is that we run from irritating occasions. Events that can make us angry, we avoid. We avoid. Okay, next is temptation. Okay, next is temptation. We're coming to the real important issues. How can we keep the heart when Satan tempts us? The danger, of course, is having a low view of sin, which then leads to sinning. So how do we keep our hearts in times of temptations? We are to argue against sin in our minds first we are to know that sin hurts the conscience and communion with god okay read psalm 51 okay where we see that david is in pain because of um, his great sin he was he was suffering because of what he did so sin hurts the conscience it hurts and of course it it hurts your communion with god which is so precious to us. You can see Peter's anguish, right? When he denied Christ three times. There is a great effect of sin when believers uh, do sin. There is true pleasure in mortifying, killing sin. It pleases God and it pleases your conscience and it displays a sincerity of your religion. If you want to show sincerity, you do not sin. Okay, so if you sin, it will hurt you. And if you do not sin, you can gain pleasure in that. And this pleasure that you avoided sin is far greater than the pleasure you would have had if you had sin. We all confess that God is everywhere. But we need to remember that God is everywhere when we are tempted to sin. And we also know that uh, the preciousness of your soul that Christ has redeemed. To never forget that. Okay, Christ has redeemed our souls, so why are we allowing our souls to be in the dangers of temptations and all that, all these things that can hurt our soul? Arguments against sin. When tempted to see sin as small, we are to remember that God's holiness is infinite and there is great injury when we sin all these small sins. And sometimes we argue that you know, God can, will pardon this sin that I will commit. Okay, we can have all these kind of arguments in our hearts. Well, this promise of pardon is not for presumptuous sinners, sinners who willingly sin again and again. Numbers 15.30 The soul that doeth sin presumptuously that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Right? So there's no promise for pardon for those who willingly sin the same thing, sin, sin the same sin again and again, and have no sense of remorse. There's no promise of pardon we'll find in the Bible for this kind of presumptuous sin that continues on and on without remorse. Yes, God is merciful. God pardons. But should you abuse that mercy of God? And this 
argument. No, godly men have sinned before and are restored. David sinned before and he was restored, so I shall be restored as well. But let us remember, did all these men sin presumptuously? Right? David, when he sinned, he grieved. It was a great sin against Bathsheba and Uriah, but he grieved, he repented. He did not go on continuing to sin. He did not sin presumptuously. And did God record all these examples? For example, David, you know, with Bathsheba, you know, Psalm 51. Did God record all these examples for my imitation to follow or for my warning? If you read this passage, you see that we are we learn of all these examples for our warning, for admonition. And last, do you realize their chastisement for their sins? So all these godly men that have sinned before God, for example, again, David and Peter, right? They, they suffered. They grieved a lot for their sin. Okay? So all these men have, because of their sin, they, 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 they suffered. So let us not think that these things are things that we should follow. Okay? These things are written for our warning. Okay, last season is seasons of spiritual doubt. How can we keep the heart when we are doubtful of our salvation, our relationship with God, when God seems distant from us? The danger is that there is great spiritual inner unrest in us in this season. So some counsels. Acts of sins do not define us. Again, back to the example of David and Peter. These people were godly men who fell into sin. So the best of believers struggle with sin. But we do not let these sin, sins define who we are in Christ. So are we being too severe to ourselves in these times of sin? Yes, we have sins. We, are, we have sins. But are they mingled with good works? So the, the Christian in this life is a mix of sin and good works. So is it right to just concentrate on what we fill in? Is it right to just concentrate on our sins and not knowing the good works that we have done by God's grace that show that we are believers? Are we going to let every feeling make us question our salvation? How then do we attain the peaceful life that we are called to? Are Christians called to doubt their salvation every time that they sin? In our darkest times, we are not the best judges of our condition, right? No, we are emotional people and sometimes we can overreact. So in our darkest times, right, we are not the best judges of our spiritual condition. So that implies that in our darkest times, we seek counsel from other people, other people that have observed our lives that can help us to see our conditions with us. Sin does not, does not destroy our relationship with God, just like sins in a marriage. So if you know, a husband or the wife sins against the spouse, does, not, does that mean that the marriage is over? No, right? So sin does not destroy our relationship with God. And our sins should drive us to God and not away from God. So in times of spiritual doubt, we are to seek God and not to run away from God. There are times where we feel a lack of love towards God. Now, believers do, do lack in love. That's why Paul prays in Philippians 1.9 that our love may abound more. To put it, put it in a simple way, there's always room for improvement, right? So we pray to God that our love may abound more. So if you feel a lack of love towards God, and you want to feel more love towards God, you pray for it. Next, do not be discouraged that you are not what you want to be in your spiritual life. Instead, look at your own spiritual growth that has already happened. So sometimes some believers are ambitious for their spiritual life. They want to do this. They want to feel this way. They want to do this, do that. Now, it's good to be ambitious. But this over-ambitiousness can discourage us sometimes, right? 
So let us just pause, take a step back, and not to be discouraged at what we lack, but rather to be encouraged at what we have. Okay. After being encouraged by what you have, then we seek uh, God's help in filling what we lack. So just to conclude, let us know our hearts. Let us know the current situation of our hearts. Is it discontented? Is it angry? You know, let us know our hearts in order that we can keep our hearts. And in keeping our hearts, we have to know what unsettles our hearts. Is it the things that are happening around the world? Is it spiritual issues? Is it both? And let us find God's promises to keep our hearts. You find many of these promises everywhere in the Bible, right? So that gives us an incentive uh, to read our Bibles. That's where we find God's promises that settle down our hearts. And whatever situation, whatever season we are in, we are to ensure a right understanding of who God is and who we are to Him. If we are unsure of this and this, we are in no position to keep our hearts. The first basic thing we are to do in unrest, in seasons of unrest, is to know who God is, right? Because God never changes. In our times of uh, changing seasons here and there, many things happening in our hearts, we are to have the firm knowledge of who God is. And from then, we know who we are to Him, and then we can, we can start to strive to keep our hearts. Okay, so that ends uh, this lesson. I pray that it will be helpful for you. I'll see you in the next lesson. Goodbye.